Hi, welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about breastfeeding. You guys have been sending me all of your breastfeeding questions. So today um, I'm going to put those all in one place and answer all of your breastfeeding questions. So you can follow Child Care Answers on social media, like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and visit us on our website where we house tons of parenting resources and information. And then our YouTube channel is just chock full of recorded webinars specifically for you. So to go ahead and get started, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lauren. I am the Family Support Specialist with Child Care Answers. I have over 10 years of infant toddler expertise. I am a certified lactation counselor, and I'm also a mom of two. So in these pictures, you'll see my youngest, Claire, but I also have a seven-year-old. So I have a seven and an almost three-year-old. So these are from a little bit of go. So I breastfed both of my kiddos, but I had lots of issues. Um, I like to joke that I am the only lactation counselor who makes no milk, um, but between tongue tie, lip tie, um, low milk supply, thyroid issues, um, my son was failure to thrive. We encountered lots and lots of issues. And because of that, I became a certified lactation counselor. Um, so with my son, because he was not gaining weight well and I wasn't making a ton of milk, I nursed and pumped him for, pumped, not pumped him. Um, so because I wasn't making enough milk, I nursed and I pumped every feeding for the first year. My goal was to make it to two, um, but we only made it to a year. But still, that's a huge accomplishment. For my daughter, she was tongue-tied. Um, and needed supplemented right away because of that and got too used to the bottle and completely refused to nurse until she was about six months old. So the picture on the left is me pumping, um, which I did very often. The middle picture is of her with milk dribbling down her face um, in the feeding immediately following her tongue tie revision, but that was short lived. And then the picture on the right is of her nursing at six months when she started that back up again. Um, so that was pretty amazing that I was able to kind of stop pumping at six months and just nurse her for a couple of months, twice a day, until essentially I ran out of milk and she got tired of it. So that is a little bit about my nursing journey. It's not cute, it's not pretty, um, but I wouldn't trade any of it for anything and I would do it all over again in a heartbeat. So every mom's journey looks different. Every mom's breastfeeding looks different. Whether you have tons and tons and tons of milk, whether you donate your milk to a milk bank, whether you're the fortunate donor of milk, which I am, I love my milk fairies, um, or whether you're exclusively pumping and anywhere in between. Um, all of our journeys look different, so hopefully today, we can talk a little bit about some of those hiccups that you might be experiencing or for our new moms about what your journey may look like um, as we head down the road of breastfeeding. Um, so while I was kind of presenting all of these questions and having these conversations, which I welcome um, the continued feedback as well, I just wanted to let you know that there were no bad questions and there are no bad questions. If you have a question, I am here to answer it or to find those resources. Again, if I don't know the answer to something, I will find it. So I did a lot of research as we go into um, preparing for this webinar. Um, this conversation can continue beyond today. So I am a resource to you. Um, so whether it's tomorrow or two years down the road, email me, call me, let's meet via Zoom and let's talk about breastfeeding and how I can support you. Um, when it comes to nursing, mom shaming will not be tolerated. So a fed baby is a happy baby, plain and simple. Um, so however moms choose to feed their babies or however it works out for them and their family is the best choice that they're making for themselves. 
I also wanted to say happy National Breastfeeding Month. So we are recording this in August. So August is World Breastfeeding Week. It's also Native Breastfeeding Week and Black Breastfeeding Week. So all of those happen within National Breastfeeding Month. And so I want to just congratulate all of our nursing moms um, and really support and normalize breastfeeding. So as we get started, let's kind of just go through an overview of breastfeeding um, because to breastfeed, you kind of have to understand breast milk and breastfeeding and also to support a nursing mom, um, this is helpful information as well. So every drop of breast milk contains thousands of working and living cells, which are full of protective antibodies that are there to prevent infection and sickness, which is really amazing. So as moms are nursing, they're getting signals from baby to say, hey, I have this cold or I have this, I've been exposed to this. And mom's milk changes to adjust to basically provide the antibodies against that particular illness, which is amazing. There are currently over 800 known components of breast milk and scientists are still, still discovering new properties every single day. And moms don't need to maintain a special diet in order to provide quality milk. Human milk contains all of the optimal nutrients for baby for growth and development. In addition to that, breastfed babies eat based on calories, not on volume, meaning as baby gets older, the composition of breast milk changes. So a typical baby at one month and at six months is taking about the same volume of milk but what is packed into that milk is very, very different. So if we think about a newborn drinking colostrum, right, that's thick, it is goldeny delicious, it is that milk really designed to build, build that baby's immune system from day one. It's not the same milk that a baby at one month is drinking as that milk has transitioned. Um, very similar to how at six months that baby is drinking different milk because that composition has changed over time. We also find that most babies eat pretty often, every hour and a half to three hours, because all of that milk is quickly and completely utilized by baby's body, which is also why it's gonna be pretty rare for a baby to drink an eight ounce bottle who is on breast milk. Um, they're typically going to be taking short, smaller bottles about two and a half to five ounces, again, every hour and a half to three hours. Um, if they're drinking at the breast, that's kind of how much you would be expecting for them to be taking. Um, again, they're eating again more frequently or uh, more often compared to a formula fed baby. And we see that breast milk consumption does decrease slightly when introducing solids at about six months. When it comes to duration of breastfeeding and expectations, um, I think it's important to state that there really is no limit on when you should stop or start nursing, right? So as moms are beginning this process, maybe they change their mind at two weeks um, and they decide, never mind, I do want to nurse. There is a way to kind of build up that supply or bring back a, a milk supply. There's also not a limit on how long a mom should be nursing. Um, so all of the recommendations are strictly that, they're recommendations created within the norm of that culture. So the American Academy of Pediatrics within the American culture's recommendations are to breastfeed exclusively for six months, meaning that baby is only getting breast milk for the first six months really delaying the onset of solids until that six month mark. They also recommend that breastfeeding happens for at least a year and then after as mutually desired, meaning basically continued as long as baby and mom are still wanting to nurse. Again, these recommendations happen within the context of culture. So the World Health Organization and the Canadian Pediatric Society's recommendations are similar to the AAP, but their duration is really at least two years, and then again, as mutually desired thereafter. So the longer an infant is breastfed, the greater protection from illnesses and long-term disease, 
additionally, the more months or years a woman breastfeeds is combined with all of her children um, is the greater benefit of health overall for mom. So as we're talking about mom's nursing, I think it's also important to talk about her partner and how that partner can support her in her breastfeeding journey. So you wanna make sure as a partner that you're caring for mom. You're looking for practical ways that you can care for her while she's nursing, like bringing her a glass of water, giving her a pillow, removing distractions like older siblings, visitors, or pets. You can also bring your baby to your partner, especially during those night feeds, and then settle baby after back to sleep so that mom is really only awake to feed and then you're kind of responsible for the beginning and the ending of that time frame. Also, as we're talking about breastfeeding and being a new mom, I think it's important to note that partners should really be patient if your partner doesn't feel like being intimate with you. They're probably tired, distracted from feeding and caring and settling baby, and also hormones are kind of out of whack and we're feeling a certain way. Um, so it's important to be patient in that regard. You can also encourage your partner to drink plenty of water, make sure they're getting a lot of healthy foods to eat, because breastfeeding will make her very hungry and very thirsty. And proper nutrition and drinking enough water is an indicator on milk supply. As you're caring for a baby, it's also important that you are providing some skin to skin, that you are wearing baby, that you're bonding with baby just as much as mom is. Take charge of other duties like bath time or settling baby before bed so that she doesn't have to do everything. Um, and it'll give you those really sweet moments to spend one on one with your baby. And then again, you can help settle your fussy baby before a feeding because a fussy baby doesn't want to nurse. So you can burp after the feed, you can settle them before the feed, and again, kind of be responsible for the before and the after of a nursing session. I think it's also important that you're encouraging her, that you understand breastfeeding, and that you really become her champion whether she breastfeeds for three years or she's not able to do it in the long term. If she's having struggles, you're finding those support groups, you're driving her there, you're encouraging her every step of the way. So as your questions were coming in, I tried to kind of stick them all into one place so that I knew, hey, here are all of the things that I need to discuss today. So I'm not gonna read the list because I'm gonna go into depth about each one of these individually so that you can really see um, kind of an overview of breastfeeding support. So the first question you had was around bottle feeding. What bottle should I choose? How should I introduce a bottle? And what do I do when my baby just downright refuses to take a bottle? First of all, when it comes to choosing the right bottle, there is no one right bottle for you and for baby. It really is about choosing a bottle that may meet your needs the best. When it comes to a breastfed baby, you wanna choose something with a wide base and the slowest flow nipple possible. I mentioned earlier that my daughter got too used to the bottle and refused to nurse, and this is because the slow flow nipple we were using was not slow enough. She got used to the flow of the bottle, the milk came a lot quicker than my letdown gave, and then she was like, I've had enough, this is too much. So I'm not going to recommend one particular brand of bottle, um, but I will say that we used the Medela bottle and their slow flow nipple is just not that slow. So, when you're looking at bottles, check the, how fast the milk goes through the nipple um, and know if you can interchange nipples out. Um, the Dr. Brown nipple comes in a preemie and a slow flow that are both great and they can be used inside of the Medela bottle. Other bottles like Avent, Tommy Tippy, um, basically a lot of the ones that you're seeing in this picture are all made very similar in size. And so you choose kind of the one you like the best. 
Um, in this picture as well, you'll see the Komotomo bottle, which is the one with the green kind of disc around the top by the nipple. Um, that is an expensive bottle. Um, it's not a bottle that I would recommend purchasing 15 of if your child's going to childcare, but it is a great bottle if your baby's refusing to bottle feed. Why? Because the bottom is silicone. So you can almost use it like a syringe. So you can squeeze it to get a little bit of milk into the nipple and squirt it into the baby's mouth, which may just be that push that your baby needs to start suckling. So in instances where babies are downright refusing bottles, you've tried a couple, that is one that I would recommend trying and because of that factor specifically. If at all possible, wait until about three to four weeks in order to introduce a bottle and have someone other than mom introduce that bottle because babies are very smart and they're gonna say, wait a minute, I don't want this from there from you, I want it straight from the tap. So if mom is gone in the shower or even sometimes she has to leave the house completely um, in order for baby to start that bottle feeding process really needs to be someone other than her. When we're introducing a bottle, we wanna make sure that we do something called paste bottle feeding. So this means we're holding baby in an upright position perpendicular to the bottle and really allowing them to take control of the feed, letting them kind of draw the nipple into their mouth and then do that typical suck, 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 swallow pattern that we see in a breastfed baby. So when you're holding baby, you wanna make sure that you're holding baby kind of perpendicular to the bottle so that the bottle and the baby are in kind of this position. This allows half of the bottle to be full of milk and the other half to be full of air. It does not mean that baby is going to be sucking in tons of air and then needing to burp a lot. Really what it means is that we kind of have this ebb and flow of milk like the ocean where the baby is drinking a little bit and taking a break and drinking a little bit and taking a break. And we never wanna force the baby to finish a bottle. So I always recommend when we're starting to bottle feed, especially as baby goes off to childcare, uh, putting less in the bottle than you would typically think um, so that you're not wasting any milk. If baby is downright refusing that bottle, you've tried everything, sometimes it's just a matter of changing the temperature of the milk go cold or warmer than you may think, um, giving the bottle to somebody else, holding the baby in a very non-nursing position, so more of this outward position on your lap with the bottle perpendicular to their mouth. Um, and sometimes it's wrapping the bottle in a towel or a shirt that smells like mom. So those are a lot of different tricks on getting that baby who just doesn't want to take that milk to take one take a bottle. Also, if baby is over four to six months old, it may be best to just switch to a sippy cup instead. On our YouTube channel, there is a video of me showing a paste bottle feeding with my daughter. Um, so I will give you kind of a preview into that video. You can kind of see in this video how that bottle is more perpendicular to the baby's mouth, and baby is more in an upright position, and the baby is more in control of the feeding. So to watch more of the Pace Bottle feeding video, visit us on YouTube and check that out. This is a great video too, to send off to childcare, babysitter, grandma, so that anyone caring for your baby is feeding your baby, in the similar type of fashion. Another question that came up was about supplementing. So as we're talking about bottle feeding, what about those babies who do need to be supplemented? So when it comes to supplementing, there are several different ways in, that you can supplement your baby, but it's always best that this happens alongside of a pediatrician or a lactation consultant. So that conversation is happening over the course of the time that you're supplementing, whether it's with a bottle, a syringe, a cup, or the SNS system like it pictured. Um, the SNS system is essentially designed for baby to be getting the milk from a tube 
um, but to still be stimulating the milk in order to increase milk supply. So when we're supplementing again, we wanna make sure that we're monitoring baby's weight, baby's diapers, and that we're doing this under the supervision of a doctor. When we're weaning, we wanna make sure that that is extra cautious. So we don't wanna drop um, supplements suddenly. This should be done very gradually, like an ounce of one ounce during the entire day. Wait a couple of days, make sure baby's still gaining another ounce for a couple of days. Not at every feed, but over the course of the whole 24 hours. Also, discuss this process with your doctor and a lactation consultant to make sure that you're doing everything you need to do in order to increase your milk supply so that baby can exclusively be breastfed at the end of supplementing. Monitor their growth and pump to increase supply. So this may mean pumping at the end of every nursing session, adding extra pumpings in, pumping in the middle of the night if baby is sleeping through the night. Um, these are all of the different things that you can do to help with that. In a little bit, I'll talk more about pumping um, and how you can do kind of this power pump or increase the amount of output you're getting while pumping. So other questions came up about comfort nursing and sleep. So breastfeeding is so much more than just nutrition um, and babies really have this innate need to suckle. If baby's not suckling at the breast, they're typically suckling on their hands or on a pacifier. And comfort nursing increases the mother-child bond. Um, and there's nothing wrong with being used, as they say, a pacifier. Um, by suckling, babies are actually decreasing their heart rate and they're relaxing. And it does not create unhealthy lifelong sleep habits. Learning to sleep on their own versus being nursed to sleep um, is a milestone. They'll reach it when they're physically, developmentally, and emotionally ready, just like every other milestone. So there is nothing wrong with comfort nursing when your baby is upset, and there's nothing wrong with comfort nursing your baby to sleep. So don't let anybody shame you or make you feel guilty for doing that. Both of my babies were comfort nursed to sleep, and they sleep just fine now. They're going to go off to college knowing how to sleep. Oh, I need a room. Sorry, Kristen. They're gonna go off to college knowing how to fall asleep on their own, I promise. So it's not a bad thing. And in fact, it's a normal, healthy, developmentally appropriate way to soothe your baby. So we've also had lots of questions come in about COVID and about handling breast milk, especially from childcare providers or moms who have been tested positive for COVID. So the general guidance from the CDC is that human milk is classified as a food, not a bodily fluid, meaning you don't have to wear gloves in order to handle it, no one's going to get infected from touching your breast milk. The transmission of disease is extremely rare. And there are very few contraindications preventing moms from breastfeeding. One of them is galactosemia. It's basically where babies can't um, take in lactose in any form, including the lactose found in breast milk. Again, very, very rare. Um, but those are the type of things that I'm mentioning um, and talking about when there are very few contraindications, things that you probably have never heard anyone had. So in the majority of cases, it's totally fine for moms to be nursing. COVID-19 um, or coronavirus is unlikely to transfer through breast milk. It is not found in pasteurized breast milk at all, meaning donor milk um, that you're getting from a milk bank for those frail, tiny little babies is safe to be consumed. Um, and it is safe for COVID positive moms to continue nursing and pumping. The recommendations from the CDC is basically wash your hands and wear a mask before um, and after and during a feed, right? So wash your hands before, wash your hands after and wear a mask during.
So uh, lots of questions also came in about the introduction of solids. Because the recommendations are to exclusively breastfeed for six months, lots of questions about when do I start, how do I start, and what do I start with? Um, so it's really important to wait until that six month mark to start solids. Um, and new research is really showing to start with real foods and not cereals. Real foods have much better nutrients in them um, and babies are going to like them better anyway. And there is no real reason to start with cereals. So start with foods like avocado, banana, peas, um, these are all things that are on the sweeter side and very similar to kind of the flavors that they're getting within breast milk. Avocado is a great first food because it's a very low allergen food and it also is packed full of nutrients and healthy fats to help your baby's brain grow strong and healthy. Also, research is really showing now that the delayed introduction of high allergen foods like peanuts actually increases the chances of developing allergies and doesn't decrease them. So you don't want to hold off on a year or 18 months in order to introduce things like eggs, peanuts, dairy. All of these things should be introduced when solids is began at six months. Obviously, we're not giving a baby a huge dollop of peanut butter, but adding a little peanut butter powder or PB2 into yogurt or into their avocado or their banana is a really great way of introducing young babies to peanuts. Also, when we offer water, when we introduce solids, it does help ease constipation and allow baby to develop control over a sippy cup. We don't want them getting a ton of water, but while they're eating their solids, a little sippy of water actually does a lot of good. And then as we're feeding baby, we really want to let them take the driver's seat. We want to read their cues, allow them to be part of the feeding process, give them a spoon to hold, um, ask before you offer another bite. And this is a great opportunity to teach them some sign language so that they're able to communicate to you before they have the words to do so. So signs like more or all done are both ways that babies can say, yes, give me another bite, or no, I'm really done with this in a way that doesn't involve throwing their tray or their plate off of the tray, which they still might do. But that's part of being a baby and learning about gravity. When you're starting out the process of breastfeeding, it can be a little tricky, right, to understand, do I have the right latch? Why is this hurting? Is this supposed to feel this way? So when questions are coming in about latch, I like to really kind of split them up between what does proper latch look like, but also things that can happen because of a poor latch. So the picture here really shows you signs of a correct latch. So you have that mouth open wide, you have the chin touching the breast, you have most of the areola in baby's mouth. Baby shouldn't just have the nipple in their mouth, they should have that areola in their mouth as well. And the nose should be close to the breast but free in order to be able to breathe. So those are signs of a great latch. Signs of a shallow latch is that you can see a lot of that areola, the baby's pulling off of the breast, their chin is not touching. Those are all signs that baby is basically just nipple nursing and not full breastfeeding. They need all of that in their mouth so that they can really use their chin to push or kind of knead that milk out of the breast. Also, in the first couple of weeks, you may have a little discomfort when it comes to breastfeeding. Your nipples might be a little tender, there might be a little bit of pain at latch. Um, all of that is typical. But breastfeeding should never hurt. So a little discomfort, a little pain can be typical in the first couple of weeks, but usually gone by week three. And there should never be any skin damage. And your nipple should always look the same before and after a feed. So those are the telltale signs that latch might not be there the right way, right? Um, and if you have a problem with latch, it's really important that you get in on a one-on-one -on -one with a lactation consultant so that they can really assess the proper latch. 
So if it hurts beyond just a little discomfort, especially after week two is over, your skin is damaged or your nipple looks flat um, or white after feeding, that's really a sign of a poor latch. Um, again, some other signs of pain are tongue tie, a strong or unusual suckling, or inverted or very long nipples. So as you're kind of investigating pain, okay, I'm having pain, why am I having pain? Here are some things to kind of run through. Did breastfeeding get painful when your milk came in? Is this because of just being full and engorgement? And so we need to kind of approach it from that angle. Does your nipple look flattened, creased, or pinched when baby unlatches? Which is the telltale sign really of having kind of a poor latch um, or a tongue tie. Are you using a breast pump? Because the highest suction, suction always isn't the best. Um, and it's very easy for exclusively pumping moms or moms who are doing both pumping and nursing to experience a lot of discomfort because of the pump. Are you experiencing pain between feedings, which may be a telltale sign of a plug duck, mastitis, or thrush? And then are you breastfeeding while pregnant? Um, so if this kind of happens suddenly and you know you're pregnant and now you're having discomfort, um, it could be just because of your body changing in the hormones of pregnancy. So one of the reasons that you might be feeling discomfort is because of a plug duck um, from engorgement or inadequate mo milk removal, either because of poor latch, an ineffective suck, a tongue tie, um, sleepiness or a distracted baby, an oversupply, um, or wearing an underwire bra. So all of these things can lead to engorgement or a plug duck because of inadequate milk removal. So what this is, is basically an area of the breast where milk flow is obstructed. Um, you typically have tenderness, it's hot, swollen, or reddened looking, and again, caused by the things that I just mentioned. It is always best to treat a plug immediately and aggressively because it can escalate very quickly into mastitis. The mastitis is basically an infection that happens from typically a plugged duct or um, an exposure to something that infected the breast. And in most cases, it comes with the same pain and discomfort as plugged ducts alongside of cold-like symptoms and a fever. And in most cases does require an antibiotic. It is very, 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 very important, although it's painful, to not decrease or stop nursing because the only way to recover from a plug duct is to get that milk out. So it's super important to be nursing or pumping every two hours to continue to drain those breasts and do not stop nursing or pumping. It will get better. So when it comes to managing a plug duct or mastitis, the management of the breast is the same. The only difference is with mastitis, you may have an antibiotic, but the management at the breast is the same. So you wanna start treatment promptly, nurse frequently and empty the breast thoroughly at least every two hours, loosen your bra or any constri constrictive clothing to aid milk flow because an underwire pushing on the milk ducts can stop the milk flow. So take your bra, put something really loose on, and nurse, nurse, nurse. Also, take a pain reliever like an ibuprofen or a Tylenol or both, um, which will help with the discomfort, and it's totally fine to nurse on those medications. The real trick to fixing a plug duct is this combination of heat, massage, rest, and an empty breast. So before you nurse, you wanna use heat, and gentle massage to improve milk drainage and symptoms. So you can either dip your breasts into a bowl of warm water 
you can use a warm compress. Really the best warm compress is putting hot water into a diaper and then putting that diaper onto the breast because it really traps that moisture and that heat really, really well. Or a hot shower and then lots and lots of breast massage, especially in the area of the plug. After nursing, you want to make sure that your hand expressing to make sure that you've got everything out or pumping after the feed and then use cold compress um, between feedings for pain and inflammation. While nursing, nurse the affected breast first. Ensure good positioning and latch. And you may want to try different positions that really allow the breast to drain. So maybe the, the cradle position isn't the most effective in that instance and doing something more like the football hold may help drain that part of the breast better. Additionally, um, we're kind of massaging the breast before the feed, but also massaging it or using breast compressions during the feed. And then massage gently, um, but firmly from the plugged area towards the nipple, kind of rubbing it in this motion or using the back of your hand to push during that feeding. If your pain is coming from nursing with flat or inverted nipples, um, there are a couple of things that can help with this as well. So when it comes to breastfeeding with flat nipples, you may want to hand express or pinch the nipple before nursing to help that nipple come out. Same with inverted nipples. Um, if it's due to engorgement that your hand expressing or pumping just a little bit off before you latch baby to soften the breast and get that nipple again to pop out. Um, do some nipple stimulation in between feedings um, and a nipple shield can be helpful for this as well. So a nipple shield basically acts as a faux nipple so that if you do have inverted or flat nipples, it allows that nipple time to come out during that feed while still giving baby something to hold on to. Also really working with lactation to establish a deep latch, try different positions to see what's most effective and at what breast it's most effective at, and evaluate the look of the nipple after the nursing. Is baby able to pull that nipple out or does it still look flat or inverted after the feed? When it comes to nipple shields, we had a lot of questions come in about transitioning off of the nipple shield. I'm using it, but how do I stop using it? So again, a nipple shield, like pictured, is a thin flexible silicone cover, um, which a mother places over her nipple prior to breastfeeding. In most situations, it's temporary to help really establish breastfeeding and for a baby to just get bigger and stronger. They do come in different sizes, so you wanna make sure that you're getting one that fits the size of your nipple. As you're transitioning off of the nipple shield, um, some tips that can help it be a little bit more successful is to remove the nipple shield partway through the breastfeeding. So if the reason you're using it is because of smaller nipples or inverted nipples, um, you can start the feed with it, quickly kind of remove it once milk has let down and then latch baby back on. At that point, your milk is coming in. Um, there's something there for baby to drink, but also your nipple is likely pulled out more. So there's more for baby to nurse from. Do lots and lots of skin to skin when you're not nursing and allow baby to kind of use his instincts to find your breast naturally. Offer your baby the breast as soon as they wake up from sleep or when they're a little drowsy because they might not be as aware of what's happening and again, might just instinctually nurse. Offer the breast while walking around kind of as a form of distraction for them to think about something else while they're trying to latch and drink from the breast. You can also express a few drops of your milk onto the nipple before you breastfeed so that there's something there for them to taste and to smell that will encourage them to latch. And at the end of the day, be patient. If you start and it's not working, it's not time yet. 
And let's start again maybe in a week or two. Give your baby some time and give you some time to do this whole transition period effectively. Another question is on milk supply. So how much should I expect? How do I increase my supply? What should I be expecting baby to take from the bottle when I'm away from baby? Kind of all of these questions around supply. So a baby at one day and one month are taking very different amounts of liquid. And after one month, it pretty much stays consistent. So as baby is growing and they're developing and their stomach expands, they're going from day one of taking just a couple tablespoons to taking two and a half to five ounces at each feed by one month old. So it does take your body about a month to really create and maintain a milk supply. So that is where a lot of the time can really be devoted to increasing milk supply is during that first month. Um, because after a month, that's pretty much your supply. That doesn't mean that you can't change your supply, um, but that's really when supply is forming. So factors that really affect milk yield, number one is your baby. You shouldn't be expecting to pump five ounces of milk when your baby's two days old. A, because that's a lot of milk, and B, it's because your body knows that your baby does not need that amount of milk yet. Also, when it comes to output and what you're pumping, pumping is not a great indicator of how much milk you make because whether you're exclusively breastfeeding or exclusively pumping or doing somewhere in the middle, your output is going to look different because of the way that you're expressing milk. Also, the time between feedings or pumpings will affect supply. So if baby is only gone 30 minutes between nursing and they're wanting to nurse again, there's obviously going to be a lot less milk there than if your baby slept for five hours. Time of day matters. So the morning pumps or the morning feeds are going to have more milk than the end of the day. Your emotional state matters as well. So making sure that you're taking care of yourself, you're taking care of your emotions, you're eating and you're drinking. Self-care is really important. And also, every woman is different. So every woman has a different breast storage capacity. And when it comes to pumping, pump quality matters and fit matters. So a great tool is the kellymom.com milk calculator. So if you just Google that, it really takes you right to it. And it's a way of inputting how many feedings your baby is doing in 24 hours and it outputs how much your baby then should be taking at each feed. This is a fantastic tool for if you're going back to work and you wanna know how much milk to put in your baby's bottles when you are away from baby. So as you're pumping, um, you wanna make sure that you're choosing a type or a brand of pump that depends on your pumping frequency. So if you're just pumping occasionally, a smaller pump or something that came free with insurance is totally going to be effective. If you are going to be pumping more frequently, like you're going back to work or if you're exclusively pumping, you're going to want something that has a stronger motor or a stronger capacity. If you're exclusively pumping, I highly recommend buying or renting the Medela Symphony, which is expensive, um, but if you buy it, you can basically sell it back on eBay for what you paid for it. And it is a medical grade pump that is just way more efficient at removing milk than any other pump on the market. When it comes to how long you should be pumping, you really want to look at that 10 to 30 range. Um, so 10 minutes kind of minimum. If you just have a little bit of time to pump, 30 minutes being your max really aiming for pumping until the milk stops flowing and then pumping for about five more minutes thereafter. Pumping output varies by a lot of different factors and it again is never a reliable indicator on how much milk you're producing. And breast compressions during pumping can increase output. 
just like breast compressions, help get that milk out with plug ducts. It's doing the same thing with pumping. And if you're really looking to increase supply while pumping, you can do power pumping. You basically do this a couple days in a row, and that's it, um, once a day or twice a day. And you pump for 20, rest for 10. Pump for 10, rest for 10, pump for 10. This is the way to tell your body, make more milk, make more milk, make more milk. Um, I always did this in the evening after my baby went to bed. It's a great way of saying, hey body, make more milk. And also at a time where bodies are making less milk anyway. For those of you who are exclusively pumping, pumping is going to look a little bit different um, than those who are doing that combination between nursing and pumping. So you wanna pump at least every three hours for about 20 minutes at a time. And ideally two times at night until breastfeeding is really, really established or your supply is really, really established. Um, so overall, the breastfed baby takes about 19 to 30 ounces a day. So that's really all you need for them the next day. So don't stress over stash photos on the internet um, because the majority of pumpers only get three to four ounces per session. So all of these pictures of people with tons and tons and tons and tons of milk in the freezer is not the reality for a lot of moms and shouldn't be something that we're striving for. And then some tips are to use lots of lanolin before you pump to really help everything slide and there's not a lot of friction. And then the refrigerator trick. So instead of washing your pump parts at every pumping, rinse them and stick them in the fridge and only wash them once every day or once every other day. This saves tons of time. So when it comes to building that freezer stash or kind of th striving for those pictures on the internet, um, there are some things that you can do to increase your supply or to get a little extra milk, especially for moms who are exclusively nursing at the breast. So you can do what's called a regular pumping, which means that you pump every day at the same time of day to train your body to make basically one extra feed worth of milk per day um, so that you're basically then storing three to four ounces possibly every single day. And really your baby only needs 19 to 30 ounces a day. So if you're really aiming for kind of 25 ounces a day, your baby only needs a freezer stash of maybe two days worth of milk in case you're separated or you're going on a trip or things like that. Um, you can also pump the excess after the morning feed. So sometimes that very first morning feed, baby's only nursing from one side, go ahead and pump the other or pump at the remainder of the feeding for a few minutes to get whatever's left. You could also use things like the haka, which is pictured in the middle picture. Um, it suctions onto the breast while nursing, and it can help just kind of catch those drops that would have gone into um, a breast pad instead. And some moms can get a half an ounce to two ounces of just drip from the other side. Some other tips on increasing milk supply um, is using breast pumps, like I also mentioned, using herbs like fenugreek and blessed thistle, and then medications like um, domperidone, which can either be compounded or bought overseas online, um, and it's not as sketchy as it sounds, I promise, um, or other medications that your OBGYN can prescribe. Also oats, getting good rest, lots and lots of water, um, relaxing, and eating proper nutrition will all help build that milk supply as well. So as we're talking about nutrition and mom's diet, that brings us to those questions about, can I eat this, can I drink that, and why does my baby's poop look like that? So if you ever attend a lactation support group, there will be conversations on the green pill. 
Um, so green poo isn't necessarily abnormal, but what we're really talking about with the green poo is that frothy, plentiful poop um, that basically signals that a mom has oversupply, she's making too much milk, or the green poo that comes with mucus, that really means that baby is having a sensitivity in mom's diet, probably from dairy. That doesn't mean that mom needs to stop nursing. Um, it just means that she may need to cut dairy out of her diet. Also, when it comes to oversupply, working with a lactation consultant to kind of bring, bring down your supply so that baby is getting adequate hind milk and fore milk and not just getting all of that fore milk. So breast milk, breast milk poop is yellow and seedy. Um, that's what we typically expect. If it's green, it's not necessarily area of concern, but if it's green and frothy and very plentiful, again, maybe an oversupply issue. Um, if it's green and mucusy and baby is fussy, it may be a dairy intolerance. So now we'll talk about scheduled feedings versus feeding on demand. Um, so you may have a doctor or a lactation consultant tell you, you need to feed your baby every hour and a half or every three hours or at nine and noon and three and six. Um, and take all of that information kind of with a grain of salt and make the best plan for you and your family. At the end of the day, breastfed babies eat every hour and a half to three hours. So you know in that three hour window that your baby is going to need to eat. But if baby wants to eat at an hour and a half, you don't want to make them wait until three hours. So feeding on demand or on cue is more of a baby friendly approach to feeding. So if we're getting our eight to 12 feedings in for 24 hours, baby is getting enough. Um, so Research has really shown that 70% of breastfeed babies reach fasting states within three hours, which means that they're kind of starving by the three hour mark, but only about 17% of formula fed babies do. So again, the way that a formula fed baby drinks and the way that a breastfed baby drinks are just very different. Other times that this, this might become a conversation is when baby is entering childcare where that childcare provider might not be as familiar with breast milk, they're looking for more of a scheduled approach to feedings and comparing that more to a formula fed baby. So it may be helpful to tell them what cues to look for that your baby is hungry, give them kind of this window of expectation for a feed. This is what feedings typically looks like at home, um, but also giving them wiggle room and so that their feeding baby is close to the way that you feed baby as they possibly can. So as we're talking about bottles and feedings and scheduled feedings and all of that, it kind of brings us to this conversation of storage and handling as well. Um, so these are the recommendations from the CDC. We always know that CDC recommendations are on the conservative side because they're basically saying, Nothing is getting transmitted if you follow this protocol. So we know that milk is good for longer than this, um, but these are kind of those guidelines set by the CDC. When in doubt, smell the milk. If it smells bad, it's bad. If it doesn't smell bad, it's probably not bad. So freshly expressed or pumped milk is good for four to eight hours at room temperature on the counter. But if you know you're not going to use it, stick it in the fridge as quickly as you can. Um, but what's helpful for this is if you're pumping in the middle of the night, you don't have to go clean your pump parts and put it all away. You can rinse your pump parts. You can set the milk out on the counter and put it away in the morning. It's in the refrigerator good for four to five to six days. Um, again, if you don't think you're going to use it in that time frame, stick it in the freezer. And then it's good in the freezer for up to 12 months. And again, more likely longer than that, depending on the type of freezer. Um, a deep freeze is going to be good a lot longer um, than in like the door of the regular freezer. 
thawed, previously frozen milk, when it is completely in its thawed state, is only good at room temperature for about an hour to two hours, and only good in the refrigerator for about 24 hours. So we want to make sure that we're only thawing the milk that we know we need. So as I'm thinking about sending my baby off to school, I would put the milk in the refrigerator to thaw, knowing that it would not be fully thawed in the morning, but that I could thaw it more under running cool water. And then if I wasn't going to work, if for some reason I woke up and I wasn't feeling well or baby wasn't feeling well, then that milk wasn't fully thawed yet. And I knew then that it would take the rest of the day to thaw it, or I could stick that back in the freezer because it was not thawed yet. And then any milk left over from a feeding is only good for about two hours after that feeding. So good basically till that next feeding. So you wanna make sure that you're using that first. In childcare, childcare providers have to discard that milk after one hour. Um, so that is why I say offer smaller bottles if your baby is going to childcare so that you're not wasting milk. So on the other kind of side of the spectrum when it comes to breastfeeding is kind of the end of the journey of breastfeeding, whether it's weaning or tandem nursing because you've had the next baby come along lines. Um, so first of all, when it comes to tandem nursing, that nursing a baby and a toddler is a normal cycle in breastfeeding all around the world. Um, a lot of moms feel a lot of shame around tandem nursing or they don't admit that they're doing it. And this is essentially when you're nursing a toddler and a new baby at the same time. There is nothing to feel shame about when it comes to tandem nursing. It is a normal cycle in breastfeeding. Which then kind of brings up this question of weaning. Um, so the when and how is really a personal decision that the mother makes for herself and for her child and should never be a result of someone forcing you to wean. Um, that is really your choice. Um, but it should be gradual. So you want to make sure that you're not weaning cold turkey because the breast can get very painful and engorged and then you're at a high risk for things like mastitis, a plug duck, or thrush. So you wanna make sure that it is a slow process, um, typically cutting out one feeding a day for a couple days or a week or even longer, and then the next, and then the next, and the next. Usually leaving the morning feed and then before sleep feeds. Um, and then before sleep feeds are usually the last ones to go again going back to our conversation on comfort nursing the older the child um, the more morning breastfeeding can happen both for you and for the child so take pictures read books about breastfeeding have lots of conversations with your toddler about it because if your child is older they're going to be a lot more aware and may say like i miss nursing or whatever they call it um, so morning or this loss of breastfeeding is still very typical, which is why I showed you a picture of my daughter nursing at six months, uh, because every time she nursed from six to nine months to basically when she stopped, I photographed because I didn't know if that would be the last time she would nurse. So those pictures really can last you forever. And then last but not least, work, traveling, and medications. So we're not doing a ton of travel right now. And lots of moms are really fortunate enough to be with their babies right now and not be separated because they're not going into the office, they're working at home, which can present its own set of challenges. Um, I was very glad when childcare opened back up for my two-year-old but it can also be this really awesome experience to increase the amount of time that mom and baby are getting to spend together. So first and foremost, flying with breast milk. You wanna notify the TSA officer that you are carrying breast milk and that you are a nursing mother. They are permitted, um, you are permitted to carry through security 
formula, breast milk, and juice for infants and toddlers in reasonable quantities. You want to make sure that these things are carried and removed outside of your bag and screened separately. Typically, you have two choices when it comes to being screened. You can have that milk swabbed or it can be sent through the x-ray. Those are kind of your options. Um, but you want to make sure that you're not carrying them in large, large quantities so that you're not carrying 30 ounces of milk in one container, that they are really separated in one to eight ounce quantities. Anything over 3.4 ounces um, will need to either go through screening or get swabbed. I also find it very helpful as you're traveling to basically print off and bring with you TSA's guidelines on breastfeeding. So if you ever encounter a situation where they're not receptive to your breast milk coming through security, that you can basically pull out the documents to say, this is what you're required to do when it comes to my breast milk. Some officers are great and others are uneducated. So you can be that one to educate them and help that next mom who comes through um, with her carry-on. There are also tons and tons of companies who will ship your breast milk for free or very, very cheaply so that if you are away for an extended period of time for either work or pleasure, that you can then have most of that milk sent back um, via mail and not having to carry 100 ounces of milk through security. Also, as we're looking at breastfeeding in the workplace, outside of even just traveling, um, you want to make sure that you know your rights as an employee, but also as an employer that you're supporting um, the women's rights and laws around breastfeeding. So we want to respect our laws on breast milk and breastfeeding. We want to provide reasonable paid break time to pump or express milk. Um, so if you're not getting that adequate break time, look into the law um, because you're likely covered. And there should also be um, places for you to be expressing milk that is a non-bathroom space that's private, that has a lock, and that has an outlet. Even if that means that the only room in that entire building is the boss's office, that that is the room that's being provided for you to pump. So make sure, again, that you know your workplace laws. Um, and if you have questions related to this, let me know. Last but not least, medications. So I already mentioned that ibuprofen is completely safe to be breastfeeding on. So there is a fantastic app from Dr. Hale, who is the key researcher when it comes to medications and mother's milk called Lactmed or the mother's milk app. There's two of them, one designed for moms, one designed for healthcare. I have them both because I like to look up the medications on both ends of things. Um, but that is kind of my one place that I look first and foremost and trust above all is that mother's milk app. Any medication, whether it is a prescription medication, an over-the-counter medication, or medications used during surgery are all found on that app. It basically tells you, is it safe? To what level is it safe? And is there a safer alternative to the medication? Oftentimes, doctors, pediatricians, um, surgeons, and pharmacists are giving you information that is there to keep you and your baby safe. But sometimes that information is not the most accurate. So if someone tells you it is safe or is not too safe to nurse on a medication, always double check it again in the app before you know what to do because sometimes you'll look it up and it'll say, totally safe to nurse on. Or maybe you're told, yeah, you can nurse on that. And you look it up and it's like, do not nurse on this. So you always wanna check it there first. Again, it also gives you alternatives. So if your doctor prescribes one medication, look it up on the Mother's Milk app or Lactmed together and say, hey, this medication doesn't seem to be compatible with breastfeeding, but this one is instead. Can we discuss doing this one instead of this one? 
Same with going into surgery. Talk with the anesthesiologist to see if this medication is safer than this medication. Um, so that is kind of your one-stop shop when it comes to medications and always trust that over everything else. That is my big recommendation on medications and breastfeeding. So I think that about covers all of your questions. I know it was a lot. You've hung on for a long time and I really appreciate that. Um, but hopefully I answered them all. If you have questions that we did not talk about today or that you want further clarification on, let me know. Um, I can always send you a copy of this PowerPoint as well, which has several links to outside documents or resources that you can read more on. Child Care Answers Services Central Indy, so Hamilton, Hendricks, and Marion. But if you live outside of our area, there is a family engagement specialist there to support you and I can always connect you to. Just because you don't live in my area doesn't mean that I can't help you or send you these great resources. And just kind of an overview of our team, because we're here to help. Benito is our bilingual family and community engagement specialist. He does all things Spanish. Um, so this PowerPoint can be translated into Spanish if that's what you need for yourself or your clients. Chrissy is our family engagement specialist, and then again, I am the family support specialist. If you need any support, don't hesitate to email us or complete our family info form. It's just bit.ly slash CCA family or text care to 833-222-1221 or just go find it on our website at childcareanswers.com. Thank you guys and have a wonderful day.